Okay, so um, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Benjamin Bokite, and I'll be speaking on real-time fraud detection using machine learning. And I would like to state, uh, what I would like to state is that um, even though this um, research um, is conducted and currently I work at First Citizens Bank, um, the views and also the um, research that I'll be sharing here this morning um, is not in any way tied with my current employer, but it's just based on my years of experience, my years of working in the in the fraud industry and also my expertise uh, in the uh, fraud space. So for introduction, uh, I'll run through the first few slides uh, real quick so we can have much more time on the methodology and also the real-time applicability. So for introduction, uh, as we are well, all aware, the issue of fraud affects um, several agencies, it affects individuals, governments, and also nations across the globe. And to be specific, um, a recent publication by the Federal Trade Commission reveals that consumers reported losing over 10 billion to fraud in 2023, um, a figure which is 14% more than what was reported in 2022. And also on a global scale, the United Nations Office on, on Drug and Crime estimated the value of money laundering, which is the movement of monies made from um, illegitimate activities to legal activities I mean, a year amounted to two to five percent of global GDP, which is um this this percentage is um eight eight hundred billion to two trillion um USD. Just a quick oh, sorry, just just a minute. Um, uh, I think I have a bit of technical issue with my channel. Can you can you all see my screen? Yes, Mr. Hello? Benjamin. Yes, yes, Mr. Benjamin. Uh, I don't know what's my laptop is. It keeps yes. freezing here. We can see your slides. Okay. So, sorry, let me pick it up from here. So, according to the United Nations Office on Drug and Crime, the estimated value of money laundering in a year amounted to 2 to 5% of global GDP, uh, which is 800 billion to 2 trillion USD. So that's given the uh, this compounding issue of fraud and also the rising um, nature of fraud across the globe. There's therefore the need for institutions and also governmental agencies to adopt a more sophisticated means um, to fight this um, increasing trend across the globe. And machine learning me methods or algorithms over the years have proven to be an effective means to prevent fraud because the algorithm algorithms can learn the, the, from the historical patterns of data identify those parties that are connected to fraud and also flag them if they reoccur in the future. So in this project, um, I had three main objectives. The first one was to determine the most efficient machine learning method in detecting fraud out of a list of uh, machine learning methods that I, I, I developed. And the next was to develop the, was to determine the percentage of fraudulent activities detected by the chosen model or the final model in the risk has been in real time. And lastly, I provided sharp values for explainability to determine the most influential future um, in the prediction of fraud. So in this uh, project, um, the data that I used came from Kaggle, um, the data comprised of credit card transactions made by European card holders during a two day period is September, 20, 2013. And the data are some sort of class imbalance for the target class where the number of non fraudulent transactions um, vastly outnumbered um, the fraudulent transactions. So to be specific, the non fraudulent transactions in the data um, amounted to 99.83 of the total um, data, whilst the uh, fraudulent transactions amounted to 0.17% of the total transaction. And I, I would like to, what I would like to say here is um, some sort of uh, limitations um, associated with the data. The first had to do with the fa fact that um, the original features, right? So when you're building a model, you have the dependent variable with, with the target class, right? And then the independent variables, which uh, we consider to be features in the space of machine learning. Um, a principal component analysis transformation was applied to these features excluding the time and the amount feature. So all the other features, um, a principal PCA analysis transformation um, was applied to these features with the exception of um, two features, which is the time 
and the amount features. Then after the application of these principal component analysis, the final uh, features you know, that I use in the analysis um, were labeled V1 to V29, um, along with the original time and amount features. So before I could start building the model and also um, doing further testing, uh, I need to do some sort of data pre-processing. So for the data pre-processing, um, the first, what I did was I standardized the amount and the time variables or the time features using the standard scalar, uh, given that the PCA transformation were not applied to them. And secondly, um, I took care of the issue of multicollinearity where um, any of one of any two features with cor correlation coefficient of 0.099 um, was excluded from the training process. So after the exclusion, um, I had a data, a sample of data, and that sample was split into 70% for train sets and then 30% for test set, right? And after splitting the data into train tests, I corrected for class imbalance by using the synthetic minority of a sampling technique in the targeted class, right? So um, the non-fraudulent activities in the target class were more than the fraudulent activities. So I have to correct for this imbalance. And after the correction, um, the final data that I used had um, an equal amount of fraudulent activities and also non-fraudulent activities as showed in the diagram to the left bottom here. So before, um, the next thing I did was to conduct a feature selection. Um, so feature selection, I did this first to achieve a faster training time and also to prevent the possibility of overfitting. So for feature selection, what I did was I built a random forest, forest model in the early run, and then I generated a feature importance score and sorted this feature importance score and then selected the top um, 27 features to be used further in the model building. So now to the meaning methodology and also the building process. As I mentioned, the primary research methodology involves me comparing several machine learning methods to determine the best one. And to achieve this, I, I built an algorithm with 10 full cross validation for all these machine learning models that I have there, logistic regression, linear discriminant analysis, k nearest neighbor, um, classification, um, regression tree, naive bay, support vector machine, random forest, SGBoost, and light GBM. I built these algorithms using 10, 10 full cross validation. It took two days. Uh, for the computer to to successfully um, run this algorithm. So um, it needed much more computer uh, capacity. So after building the model, uh, I needed some metrics to select the best performance or the best performing model. And when I look into the literature, um, I selected these uh, metrics, the accuracy, the precision, the recall, the F1 score, um, which is the balance between the recall and the precision, the KS, which measures the maximum separation between the distribution of fraud and non-fraudulent transactions, the AUC, and also the PR AUC. And here, what I would like to mention is that because um, of the class imbalance in the data, accuracy is not the best metric um, to make the overall decision, but you need a combination of all these metrics um, to make the uh, decision as to which model is performing or which model performed um, better. So the performance of the model on the train set, right? So as I mentioned, um, I built several models using, and I use these metrics to evaluate them. Um, so after the uh, building process in the train set, um, I realized that uh, among all the models that, or among all the models that I developed, the random forest model um, gave the better performance with let's say KS of 99.99%, AUC same, F1 score, recall also same, PR AUC. The precision also gave a very good um, um a good percentage there of 99.98 and then accuracy also 99.99 right so um apart from the random forest model two other models also gave a very good uh, percentage like the sg boost and then the light gbm but then across board and when you look at all these models you realize that the random forest model has the best performance across board for all the metrics and that is what is highlighted in the red box So for the performance of the model on, on the test set, so as I mentioned, I split the data into 70 train and, and 30 for test, right? And the uh, featured model from the um, the training set was used to need evaluation of the performance of the model in the test set, right? So um, I did this in order to determine the possibility of a fitting, all right? The, post, the model could be fit in the, in the train set. So um, after 
after these um, fitted models, models were evaluated on the performance of the test set. And what I did was that I used the same metrics, right? Like the KS, the AUC, the F1 score, and the recall. Um, I generated these values from the test set and I compare the values um, from the te test set to the train set. And then I look at the percentage of reduction, right? So when you do the comparison, you realize that um, among all these models, right, when you compare the performance of the KS, right, in this test set uh, to the KS, for instance, in the um, train set, you realize that the KS um, declined by 9.09% uh, and the AUC 8.08% and then the F1 score 16.447%, and then accuracy also declined by 0.04%, which is the least amount of, um, which is the least value. So the random forest um, gave the least um, reduction in these metrics as compared to the other values or the other, other models I generated um, when you compare the train and also the test sets. And with that said, um, I selected random forest model as the best model uh, to be used further in the fraud detection or the real-time fraud detection also for sharp values explainability. So for real-time fraud detection, I would like to take my time a bit here. So um, from my years of experience in the industry, um, in real-time, what um, typically is done um, is after the predicted or after these models are built, right? The predicted probabilities from these models are converted to scores, right? And the scores are tied with a set of rules for decisioning, right? So based on the score and the rules, when a transaction lets to run through the system, it could be credit card transaction, let's say when a credit card transaction runs through um, the system or runs through the model, uh, based of the score, the model could one approve the transaction or maybe send them transaction for manual review, pending the customer's authentication, or maybe decline the um, transaction outright. So having the, that at the back of my mind, what I did was the predicted probabilities for my final random mod, random forest model, um, which ranges from zero to one, I ran in the, those these predicted probabilities to two decimal points and then multiplied um, them by 100 to bring them within a score range of zero to 100, right? One point increment. So I had zero, one, two, three, up to 100 in that order, right? And with this score um, number, you know, with this score range, um, a transaction um, with a score of 100 um, denotes a high risk transaction, whilst a transaction with a score of zero denotes a low risk transaction. And after the um, the score um, categorization, what I did was that the final scores, right, and also the predicted probabilities, I sorted them and then grouped them to 10 equal beings for further analysis. Yes, so um, I was, I'll explain, I'll take my time to explain this table here so we can all understand. So um, in real time, after the model has performed, you know, the declines and approvals of all these transactions that run through, there is a need for uh, the developers or the model owners to assess the performance of the model to really uh, understand how the model make the judgment and also the decisioning uh, to determine if the model could be used for that in the in, in, in federal operations, right? So what I, as I mentioned, uh, the risk of transaction for a, a transaction with a score of 100 is considered to be um, high risk, right? So with that said, and with that in mind, um, I group the scores uh, from 90 to 100 has the riskier score being, and then the score from 80 to 89 as the second riskier score being, and the score from 70 to 79 as the riskier score being, a third riskier score being, and that runs through all the way to the lowest score being of zero to nine, right? And what we like to see is that uh, what is expected to um, of the model is that uh, in the riskier score being, out of the total transaction, the majority of these transactions should be flagged by the model as, as fraud in the risk of score being in the test data, right? So that is what we typically would like to see for a good performing model. So when we, we can realize that out of a total transaction of 100, 92 of these transactions were flagged by the model, the random forest model, and the test data as fraud, and then eight as non-fraud, which is good, right? So out of 100, we are flagging 92, and then that follows in the next risk of, risk score being out of nine, we, we flagged eight, and then out of four, we flagged um three, right? Transaction as fraud. And then that follows through to the least risk score being. So in the least risk score being, typically what we like to see is that majority of these transactions 
uh, should be uh, should be categorized by the model as non fraud, and they should be allowed to run through the model, and approval should be generated for them, and then less of these transactions should be classified as non fraud. So, uh, what we are seeing is that out of um, a total of eighty five thousand um transactions, only fourteen of these transactions were were flagged by the model as fraud, and that is one thing that we really consider when we are making a decision as to um, the performance of the model in real time, right? So, and what I would like to mention is that in real time or in practice, um, typically the business um, unit and also the model developers who have to come together to define a threshold for fraud. So at which score do we consider uh, to be fraud, right? So at which score to be, uh, do we consider transactions to be likely a fraud, right? So when you look at our case here, you realize that um, below the score being of 70 to 79, which is 60 to 69 downwards, you realize that out of a total transaction of less than seven, uh, the model flagged only two as fraud and the rest as non-fraud. So that typically means that any transaction with a score of 70 and above could be classified as fraud and that could be tied with the rules um, to be used in decisioning, right? So the model um, in real time, um, as I said, we wanted to determine the percentage of fraud um, determined, detected by the model in the risk health score being, and this came out to be 92% um, at a detection rate of 70.77%, and that is good. So for explainability, um, as I mentioned, I use sub values, and um, just like the first presenter mentioned or highlighted, our machine learning models over the years have been considered to be some sort of black box uh, with a lot of issues when it comes to uh, explainability. And when you look into the literature, there are several um, you know, metrics or there are several methodologies that um, have been adopted to explain some of these complex machine learning mo models like the partial dependency plot, the line plot, and then also the sharp values. But then in literature, the sharp values have been used more uh, to provide this explainability. And I use that um, to kind of determine the overall influence of my features in the prediction of fraud. So to determine the most important feature, the sharp values um, summary plot uh, revealed that the V12 feature um, is the most influential feature when it comes to the, making the predictions. And this was followed closely by the, uh, the V14. And then uh, lastly, the V27 uh, was identified um, as the least uh, important feature uh, with influence on fraud um, predictions. Uh, thank you. So for the conclusion, as I mentioned, I had three objectives. Uh, the first, I wanted to determine the most efficient machine learning model, um, which the random forest um, model match as a top performing model. And I also wanted to determine the um, the percentage of fraud um, detected in the risk score being um, after identifying the best performing model. And this came out to be 92%. And from the global importance, I um, identified that uh, the V12 feature is the most influential uh, feature um, in the prediction of fraud. Okay, thank you. So, coordinator, I think I'm done with the uh, the presentation. I'd like to hand over to you. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Benjamin. Yes. 